Welcome. My name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the uh, founder and academic director at the Hannah Arendt Center here at Bard College. And um, welcome to the virtual reading group. Uh, today we are reading, um, continuing to read uh, the uh, edition, the new edition of by Jerome Cohn of Thinking Without a Bannister. This is volume two of his collection of of essays of Arendt's. There's about 50 essays in this book, uh, a third of which um, had never been published before. It's very exciting. And uh, many of which have been published uh, in, distributed in little places around. But uh, uh, working our way through this book is, is exciting. I mean, um, many of these essays are, are, are important and new. Um, some are, are similar to other things she's published. Uh, what we're reading today uh, is an essay, Authority in the 20th Century. It, it has its own interesting history. Um, she actually gave this uh, paper uh, at a conference in, um, in uh, Milan, Italy, which was sponsored by a group called um, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, now, she did not know it at the time, but the Con Congress for Cultural Freedom was a CIA front organization and was designed to um, promote uh, American ideas of freedom and democracy around the world. And, um, uh, you know, there have been some questions of whether she was a agent or some sort of thing. Um, she didn't, there's no evidence to suggest, in fact, a lot of people have tried to look into this, there's no evidence at all to suggest she knew um, about the CIA connection, uh, and yet uh, it was a conference that was designed propagandistically, and we should at least be aware of that. Um, she gave this paper, Authority in the 20th Century. Uh, it is, um, in parts, very similar, and at times verbatim similar, to parts of the longer essay, What is Authority?, which is published two years later in her book, Between Past and Future, and which we've discussed in the reading group previously. So to the extent any of you um, wanna pursue some of these questions more after today, um, I both have, a, I think, a 25 minute introduction video to the, the essay, What is Authority? And we have the uh, discussion group uh, uh, where we discussed what is authority. It's a longer and slight and more in-depth uh, account of, of this question of authority, and you could always go and, and, uh, and watch those two um, videos to, to continue your thinking about uh, this question. Um, this particular uh, essay uh, or, or speech that she gave, Authority in the 20th Century, um, because of the conference, uh, which was on uh, about the culture of freedom in in Milan uh, is really um, to some degree geared towards this question of is authoritarianism and is totalitarianism still a present uh, problem today and um, the, the 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 thesis of, of the essay and uh, it's one that I think we need to take seriously but also discuss is that authoritarianism is not only not a danger today, but is almost impossible in the modern world. Um, uh, she simply thinks that we live in a world in which authority and thus authoritarianism is something that basically no longer can exist. Um, now, that doesn't mean everything's coming up roses. Um, she thinks that, I mean, she starts the essay with the fact that the rise of fascist, communist, and totalitarian movements, and we need to pay attention to all three of those words, fascist, communist, totalitarian, and movements, um, all took place against the background, she says, more or less general, uh, of the bre dramatic breakdown of all traditional authorities. And so one of the core theses of this essay is that totalitarianism, fascism, and communism were movements that are not authoritarian. 
and and that's something that I think is counterintuitive for almost all of us. We we hear such a thing and we can either nod or we could laugh. I mean, what does it mean? And and that's in many ways what the first two sections of this essay are about, the way um, that she understands authoritarian and the way that um, totalitarianism and fascism and communism are not authoritarian. They are something else. They are, um, uh, in many ways, she says, they were well-placed. And, um, and, and she says, the, the quote is, best fitted, this is on page 69, best fitted to take advantage of a general political and social atmosphere in which the validity of authority itself was radically doubted. So one of the really quintessentially Arendtian moves, and I say that in the sense that she likes to be provocative and she likes to be counterintuitive, um, is to say that authority is not a bad thing. Um, authority uh, is something that, um, well, I mean, her definition of authority, it's not in this essay, I don't believe, but she gives it in, um, in uh, more, more, more directly in, in the essay, What is Authority? But authority is obedience where men retain their freedom. That's a very important point to keep in mind as you, as you think about it and read this essay. So when you are in an authoritarian system, you obey, but you remain free. Now, and that's gonna, why does she define it that way? Well, she thinks that authoritarianism uh, is a situation in which the authority is paramount. And as, and as a paramount, it is unquestioned. Um, and as unquestioned, everyone believes it, and therefore they freely um, uh, um, uh, obey it and, and, and follow it. And so authority, authoritarianism in its pure form could at least by some people be seen as a kind of utopianism. Um, it, it's, it's a government in which the people believe in the, um, the rightness and justness and goodness of the, uh, of the driving force of society and of the, of the political powers that represent that force. Um, and if you understand authority and authoritarianism that way, then clearly um, the, the modern age, an age of doubt and enlightenment and skepticism, uh, is an age in which um, the chance of authority is pretty nil. Um, and the argument she's making here is that, okay, when authority is nil, there are a bunch of options. Um, uh, one is, well, there's different forms of authority. There's an authoritarianism. You can move uh, from the kind of pure form of authoritarianism to a kind of tyranny uh, where one person um, seeks to represent authority uh, but is not always believed but has the power to impose it. You can move to a kind of violent authoritarianism where you seek to replace authority with violence. Um, or you can um, lead to uh, a kind of nihilism or a kind of democracy uh, in which authority is sought to be dispersed. And the argument here is that um, it's in such a situation of dispersed authority uh, where people doubt authority that there is a danger that totalitarianism and fascism would emerge. And one of the things we should probably talk about is why what the difference is between totalitarianism and fascism on the one hand and authority on the other. Well, the most obvious difference is that in authoritarianism, people are free uh, to obey. Um, and in totalitarianism, it is the uh, greatest threat to and the greatest attempt to exterminate um, freedom um, that we have. So the first section of the essay is about um, the difference between tyranny, fascism, totalitarianism, and authoritarianism. She makes these, she offers these three models of, uh, of 
um, of different forms of government, of representative models, of authoritarian, tyrannical, and totalitarian government. Um, uh, the, the authoritarian government is a pyramid with levels through it. And the premise is that the actual authority is above the pyramid. Um, and the pinnacle of the pyramid is the king or the ruler who embodies that authority, which is above him or her. And each level it is imposed down on um, until the bottom, but everybody feels that the authority that is imposed on them is just, and therefore they obey it freely. It is the most unequal uh, of the forms of government, and yet it is the most, fr it is, it is the most free. Um, because everybody uh, freely obeys the authority. Um, a tyrannical model is a, a pyramid, but without the levels, and there's just the top and the bottom, um, and connected with, she calls it these struts, uh, that are, in a sense, a kind of, of violence. Um, and then the third uh, is the totalitarian model, uh, which she calls the onion with the leader in the center or the empty space in the center um, and uh, concentric circles around it. And each circle faces both in towards the leader and outward um, towards the other. And so it provides normalcy facing outward and um, a kind of fanatic obedience facing inward. Um, and um, this, is, this is her model of, of totalitarian government. It's sketched out very quickly in this book, sketched out at more length in the essay, What is Authority? And at even more length in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, the second chapter, uh, the second section is on the need for distinctions and why we make these distinctions between these forms of government. And, and it's, it's, um, it's largely about the need to um, distinguish uh, the need for distinctions, and she says that we don't understand authoritarianism because uh, we largely see authoritarianism within both a philosophy of history um, in which we uh, um, basically, if we're liberals, we see a philosophy of history where freedom is increasing, um, and, the, uh, and, that, and that's a good thing, and any restriction on the increase in freedom is a bad thing, and so um, authoritarian government is always seen as a restriction on freedom and that's a bad thing. Or we're conservatives and we see history as the doom, the loss of authority and any increase in freedom is a uh, furthering of the loss of authority. Um, in both cases, the loss of freedom for liberals or the loss of authority for conservatives leads to fascism and totalitarianism. And she talks about how these are two sides of the same coin. and um, we need to understand that these distinctions between liberalism and conservatism, but also um, we need to understand these distinctions and think them through so that we can understand that this is all part of um, a general um, uh, movement of the modern age um, within the philosophy of history and also, she says, the rising functionalization so that we lose a sense of what authoritarianism is. And if we don't understand it, we'll never really understand how to avoid um, totalitarianism, which is the real threat, not authoritarianism. And that's, I think that's a, it's one of the really lessons of the essay, and it's going to be a controversial one. She, is, she says that it's a mistake for us today to worry about authoritarianism. What we should really worry about is totalitarianism. And... You know, we're living in an era and an age right now where whether you're in Russia or Turkey or Hungary or Venezuela and plenty of other countries, you're seeing the rise of dictatorships, tyrannies, what she would call. And what are those? Well, they're a kind of quasi-authoritarianism, but authoritarianism that's not the good kind in her mind, not based on real authority, but based on violence. Uh, it's a kind of tyranny. And while tyrannies are bad, no mistake about it, they're not as bad as totalitarianism. And so one of the things that 
she i think forces us to ask is to what extent we should fight against tyranny now i think she would fight against it i'm not trying to say not but i think she does um say that we have to in fighting against it we have to understand what the real threat is and the real threat is not tyranny the real threat is totalitarianism and um one of the things we have to make sure is that in fighting against tyranny we don't further the likelihood of totalitarianism um so we can talk a bit more about that the last chat section of this essay chapter three um is uh is about in a sense um is it possible to restore authority in the modern age and to ask that we first have to ask well what is um what is really the experience of authority and she traces it back to rome uh and to this idea of the trinity the roman trinity of tradition religion and authority and if you lose one religion tradition or authority you lose all three and she thinks that the romans were the first people to understand that you could found authority and along with tradition and religion in a founding and um she thinks that this is the example that the revolutionary experience um, and the modern revolutions sought to emulate, whether in France or in America. But in France, they failed for a whole host of reasons that she discusses in On Revolution. Whereas in America, they actually understood and partly consciously and partly unconsciously sought to follow the Roman example and refound authority, a constitutional authority alongside a tradition of the founding fathers and uh, and and a tradition of um the founding of freedom and a religion and she calls it a constitutional religion um that the secret to the american refounding of authority and the success of the american revolution was for her the moment that the constitution became to be worshipped um and and and, and there became a, a new religion in america that in the united states um that would support authority along with tradition um she thinks that that tradition and that religion and that authority in america has been largely lost today it lasted for about 150 years in her telling um and the last part of her book on revolution is about the lost uh treasure of the american revolution um which is this successful founding of freedom and authority together um and so this is a these six pages here are a very abbreviated uh telling of of that story um all right i'm gonna stop because that's uh that should be enough to at least get us going there's there's actually a this is a very dense and condensed uh essay and there's a lot to discuss in it and i'll to some degree be be guided by you guys how detailed you want to get okay um i see a first i see a couple questions already up on the chat you're welcome to keep putting questions up and hopefully we can also get some of you talking and 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 discussing the text so we'll do both the first question is from Bob Meyerson. Hi, Bob. Um, is Arendt pining? This is this is like I know Bob's always asking about the nostalgia in Arendt, so that's great. Uh, is Arendt pining for a lost ancient or medieval world where there was such a thing as authority, or is authority an ideal type that was always deeply flawed, either by slavery for the Greeks, empire for the Romans, or bureaucracy for the Catholic Church? Is it something that existed only in brief moments when the council system broke through? in moments of political chaos when was authority lost after our founding fathers established their new social secular order great uh there's about 10 questions here um but let's see what we can do so is she pining for a lost or ancient or medieval world no um i think mean, this is a 
critique you hear about Arendt a lot. It's largely, uh, you know, framed as she still wants us to live in Athens. Um, this is not um, a pro-Athenian text. Um, okay, Rome, we could replace it with, but it's not even that. Um, what, she say, what, what she's pining for is politics and freedom. Freedom is her real, we have to understand that always with Arendt, what she cares more about than anything is freedom. Uh, and so to the extent that she pines for authority, uh, it's because she thinks that freedom um, depends upon authority. Because if you don't have authority, um, freedom will always be, require limitation, uh, un, unjust limitation. I mean, freedom always requires limitation. Authority is the belief in the justice of the limitation of freedom. And so, um, to the extent she pines for or wants authority, it's in the name of freedom. Um, and so she asks, and she asked this uh, in, in this book on page 84, right? Uh, at the beginning of the section three, uh, she says, in the following concluding remarks, this is the second sentence of this section, I should like to draw your attention to one which, for many reasons, seems to me a particular rebel, uh, relevance. One question. She now asks three questions. It's crazy, but okay. And this question, this is the question of where our Occidental concept of authority comes from. So where, where does authority come from, as we understand it in the, in the Occident? The second question is, which political experience gave rise to it? So where does it come from? How did it emerge through a political experience? And finally, what kind of common public political world came to an end when not this or that specific authority in any particular realm of life, but the very concept of authority lost its validity? So um, the first question is, where did authority emerge? And her answer is, okay, in some sense, you could say in Plato, but the authority in Plato was not political, it was anti-political, it was the tyranny of reason. Um, and so she argues that even though Plato announced the authority of reason, it was an authority that was anti-political and that's antithetical to freedom, and therefore she's going to push it to the side. Um, the true source of freedom in the West, I mean, uh, authority in the West, is in Rome. And it emerges out of, as she says, a political experience. And the political experience that it emerges out of is the sacredness of foundation of founding a people, of founding a political world in which um, authority, tradition, and religion um, emerged together. Now, like I said, this is a radically condensed version of what she writes in section four of the essay, What is Authority? She does an analysis of the Roman Trinity, as she calls it, whereas authority has its root in the, um, the, uh, founding moment by which Romulus came and founded, uh, founded Rome. At the same point, the Romulus ruled Rome at the beginning in collaboration with Numa, who was the religious uh, and spiritual founder of Rome. And so authority of Romulus is added to by the religious authority of Numa. And then she says that Rome only truly founded itself and became an authority and free with the writings of Virgil, who in his um, Aeneid um, took the founding moments by Romulus and Numa and turned them into a tradition, a story that could be carried over generations. Tradition means to 
carry over. Trot, um, do carry is to carry and trot is over. So it's um, tradition is what is carried over. And it wasn't until the poet, Virgil, turned the founding moment um, of authority and religion into a story that would last um, that the founding moment um, was, was solidified for Rome. Uh, so this is the answer to the second question, or the first question and the second question, where does it come from, from Rome, and which political experience gave rise to it? The founding, the um, un-Greek experience of the sacredness and home, of home and family, and of religion, religion understood as a re legare, legation is a tying, so a tying oneself back to what? A beginning. Um, and it's this foundation that while it's new, constantly ties us back to uh, a beginning that was the great um, experience of Rome that was solidified in the writings of Virgil. Um, and then the last question, um, what kind of common political world came to an end um, when not this specific authority, but all authority uh, ended? Um, and, 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 and her answer to that is, um, well, the world in which we have authority and freedom, at which point we then confuse authority um, or we lose the idea of authority and we replace it with violence on the one hand or tyranny uh, on another. Um, and those are the mistakes that we get when we don't make the distinction between authority and tyranny and authority and totalitarianism. Um, so that's the answer to the first of, of, of Bob's questions. I'm sorry, Bob, it's a long answer. Um, but it's, so it's not that authority is an ideal type at all. Um, she thinks that it existed at different moments, uh, not an ideal type, but it was a real experience. And it came from the real experience of a foundation uh, that was at the same point um, tied to a beginning such that the people felt that the rules and the laws and the uh, rulership was just and therefore the obedience to it was free. Um, so I don't think it's an ideal type. I think it's a experience that we've had that the Romans had. Uh, she thinks the Americans had it. I'm sure there are others that have had it as well. Those are the two uh, she talks about as examples. Um, so it's not and the Greeks, you know, you mentioned slavery. Well, she doesn't think the Greeks had authority. So um, the Greeks example is not is not relevant. The Catholic Church did have authority. That's another example she offers. Um, uh, um, and one that to a certain extent was made public and political to the extent that the church became a worldly power. Um, does it exist only in brief moments when the council system broke through? No, I... I don't think so. It's not like that moment of, of freedom that she talks about in the council system. Authority can last, and it lasts so long as the stories told by Virgil or told by the American founders, maybe by Whitman or Lincoln, if you're an American. Um, I mean, Whitman specifically saw him himself as the poet of the American founding. So, so long as Whitman is seen, and read as a living poet of America. And so long as the Constitution is um, uh, worshipped and it's still seen as an authority that we all have to, and not only have to, but should want to be uh, obeying, um, it, it lasts, and it lasted for a long time. And uh, so I don't think it's a fleeting moment. Um, as for when it was lost, uh, for her, it's lost when we no longer believe uh, in the story, <laughs> when we no longer believe that the Constitution um, was 
a sacred uh, document when we no longer believe um, that uh, America is a land of freedom uh, and a new world order. Um, when the Romans no longer believed in the uh, trinity of tradition, religion, and, uh, and authority. And so when did that happen? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, probably gradually uh, over the 20th century. Um, and it's, um, you know, I mean, there's still certain pockets where that authority still is there, but increasingly gone. Um, and, and she certainly thinks so. It's a long answer to your question, Bob. Does that, you want to follow up at all, Bob, or? Uh, two ways. One is, um, I'm sorry, my question was the first one. I didn't post it until this morning. Um, I hope that, you know, other people would post their own questions so I wouldn't always be first. Uh, the second was, you talk about the founding of Rome by Romulus as being an actual fact. Well, it was a myth. So I don't know that it was a real experience. Maybe it fought, happened, but I'm pretty skeptical about that. Um, your turn. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I love that you always ask the first question, Bob. It's, it's a tradition. Um, so you, we have some authority in the group. Um, uh, you know, are you suggesting Romulus was not a real person or that he didn't found Rome? Well, um, never met him, but okay. uh, I'm thinking he exists in in that realm of of myth. Yeah, I mean, you know, a okay. lot of myths could have uh, be based on fact. Right. I mean, he, you know, the story is he 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 he's from Troy. He he escapes after the Trojan War and relocates to Rome with an army and uh, um, begins fighting some of the local Roman tribes. And then at some point they create a treaty, a peace treaty, at which they join together and Romulus becomes the namesake for Rome. Um, you know, I'm not a Roman historian. Uh, my understanding is that there's, I, I don't know. I mean, however it is, uh, Virgil then, of course, um, myth mythologizes this founding moment in the Aeneid, and and for Arendt, um, that is an important part of the uh, the happening. We probably know American history better than Roman history, so maybe we can we can tell the story in that way. Um, you know, America. Um, uh, fought a war of independence, um, had the Articles of Confederation, Constitutional Convention met, unconstitutionally decided to throw away the Articles of Confederation and start a new constitution. And um, that constitution was controversial. You had the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Debates, and then the constitution was ratified and the Bill of Rights, and over the first 10 to 15 years, there is a question, will this new country survive? Will this new constitution survive? And then you have Marbury v. Madison, and you have um, Justice Marshall um, making this claim that was not in any way obvious from the constitution itself that the constitution was the supreme law of the land and that um, and that a Supreme Court could call laws unconstitutional, right? That wasn't in the constitution. Um, I mean, some people don't think so, some people do. I mean, Marshall made the argument. And you then have the beginning of this idea uh, of this, this the United States as a constitutional republic that is under a, constitution um and that the the, the political the, the democratic and legislative and administrative and even executive functions all are under some higher non-political authority 
Um, again, that's a story that has emerged and was told. Um, you can say that that story really ends. You know, I mean, it's ended. It's been ending for a long time, but it really ends when we come to think of Supreme Court justices as um, voting, as political appointees, right? As a Republican or Democrat, et cetera. Um, you know, and for the uh, and 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 so um, we now say, you know, we can determine a case ahead of time because we know these people are going to vote this way and vote that way. Well, once once you see that, the idea that the Supreme Court and the Constitution is an apolitical, pre-political body or idea has gone. And that is for Arendt the, I think for Arendt would be the, the sort of dagger through the heart of uh, the American tradition of authority and therefore freedom. Um, but you know, that's a real event. Those are real things that happened. They're not just ideal types. I think that's the point I most want to make in well, responding. I'm mostly familiar with German history. And uh, I'm uh, not suspicious, but um, I, th I think when you look at German history and the rise of totalitarianism, uh, I think it's really inadequate to attribute it to a loss of authority with the consequent rise of mass movements. In German history, there were some very particular reasons. When Bismarck founded the, uh, the Reich, um, he has been admired by some for, uh, for stopping his wars, for being satisfied with the external boundaries, and for establishing a system which was very flawed. And uh, our system was very flawed from the beginning, too, with slavery. And the Bismarck system might have survived if it weren't for World War I. And uh, the collapse in many ways of German society and any consensus that might have existed prior to World War I, or you could argue that there was no consensus. It was just that the parliament didn't have much uh, authority. So uh, I, I just, my dad used to say uh, after somebody's long argument and hence the pyramids. And to some extent, you know, I, I see the potential or maybe the actual of loss of authority as, be, as being kind of a, a hence the pyramids without attention being paid to particular historical circumstances. I mean, so let me, I think what you've said is, is really right and important. I hope I didn't say um, authority disappeared, hence totalitarianism. Um, what, what, I, what, what, I, what I said, and I quoted her, is that totalitarianism is the, in the form of regimes as well as of movements, was best fitted to take advantage of a general political and social atmosphere in which the validity of authority itself was radically doubted. As for what brought about or allowed totalitarianism to emerge, well, she wrote a whole book on that called The Origins of Totalitarianism, which is 600 pages in which we've read. Um, and um, I've tried to make arguments about the very complicated and nuanced uh, understanding of how something like totalitarianism emerged. And it relates to um, anti-Semitism, imperialism, uh, racism, bureaucracy, um, the decline of the nation state, the failure of the nation states and the Bismarckian nation state among them, the rise of refugees. I mean, we have a lot of different elements of totalitarianism that, that she talks about in that book. All I was saying here and she's saying is that um, what we've learned in the 20th century is that it's not authoritarianism that is largely um, primed to uh, replace a failed democratic state. It's, it could be tyranny on the one hand and totalitarianism on the other. And what we've learned is that totalitarianism is 
really quite uniquely suited for it. Um, and therefore, um, we should be worried about it. I think that to be her, her point. Um, I think what we're seeing right now is another moment, a bit like the 1930s, where democracies are failing uh, around the world. Uh, and there's a deep dissatisfaction with democracy around the world. And so far, knock on some wood, what we've seen is tyranny. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, I think, the, you know, the good news. Um, because we haven't seen totalitarianism. Uh, and now, you know, People say, how can you say tyranny is good? Don't quote me like, don't say Berkowitz out there saying tyranny is good news. That's not the point. The point is that in such moments, um, yeah, well, one is preferable to the other and we need to make these distinctions. That's what this text is about. Um, and whereas tyranny is compatible with freedom, not the level of freedom that you have in authoritarianism, which is a much truer and higher level of freedom, but tyranny, at least for her, um, uh, continues to allow private freedom and, um, and civil liberties a lot of the time. As long as you allow the tyrant to keep order, there's a lot of freedom left in life. A lot of areas of life that remain free. What you don't have is political freedom. And as you know, and I know, she really values political freedom. She doesn't like tyranny. But she thinks it's different from both authoritarianism, which allows political freedom, and also totalitarianism, which is the extinguishment of all freedom. And, and so um, we just need to be Make, we need to keep those distinctions in mind. That's a big part of, of the text. Um, we can come back to some of these questions. Johanna uh, writes, or questions, I wonder if this lack of authority, as Arendt describes ironically, contributes to an apathy that seems to have defined our recent times. What I mean is that Americans seem just interested in participating in such important activities as voting. I also wonder if the backlash to all of this might mean a more authoritarian form of government in the future. Um, yes, Arendt is addressing such governments as tyrannical ones or dictatorships, but I wonder if this might not be possible in a democracy as well. This current president seems to be flirting with testing the merits of authority that is established in this country, that is the CIA and the FBI. Um, yeah, I, okay. So the caveat here is your use of authority. Um, she would not want to call tyrannical uh, forms authoritarian. Uh, I think you are right that our current president is in his deepest, darkest feelings, someone who wants to be a tyrant. I mean, if he had his way, um, he's not someone who really loves the joy and the chaos and the messiness of democratic politics. I mean, I think that's clear. Um, and so uh, we're at a moment in which I think there's, and since, and if you look at the people he respects around the world, Erdogan, Putin, Orban, these folks, he respects the people who've become tyrants or are becoming tyrants, um, dictators, whatever word you wanna use. Um, Arendt wouldn't call that authoritarian. She would call that a, um, a, a replacement of authority with violence, right? This is the confusion of functionalization, or functionalist arguments that she talks about in part two of, of, of this essay. Just because functionally um, violence keeps, makes people obey doesn't mean that violence is um, authoritarian. Um, and she thinks it's not. Uh, she thinks it's a mistake to, to call it that. You know, these are words, and, you know, a lot of people could say, why quibble over the words? I mean, we use the word authority to mean violence today. Why not just let it go? 
and and I think that's a an argument one can make and one answer is okay who cares about the words and I think in the end we can let it go but it's not the words that matter for her it's the distinctions that we have to understand for her that authority is not a dirty word especially if you love freedom she thinks the only way to really have freedom is to um, is to somehow freely embrace an authority and that requires a founding and those are hard and they're rare I mean I think this is also part of Bob's question from earlier they're not easy they can't just make it happen and so um, you know there's a kind of um, you know we need a miracle aspect of her thinking and that's not wrong either because what she says is what we've learned in history is that miracles are actually part of politics the American Revolution was for her a miracle the Roman founding was a miracle and she takes very seriously that miracles are not you know God divine things they're things that happen when people act together in ways that are seeking freedom and in seeking freedom uh, and building authority suddenly it works and um, and, and, it, and it's an amazing thing and it's a miracle but it's the miracle of human freedom to create miracles and so at the end of her essay what is freedom she defends miracles as part of um, the absolute essential uh, activity of human politics so um, we have to remember that for her miracles are not impossible otherworldly events but are human events um, the apathy question that Johanna asks is um, is a good one what's the what's the source of apathy um, uh, and is it the loss of authority um, I'm going to think this through out loud Johanna so you can we'll see how it goes um, she often attributes apathy to the loss of power in society um, so it's the feeling of disenfranchisement and disempowerment um, that leads to apathy in the sense that if you think what you do matters if you think voting matters and if you think participating in town hall meetings or getting involved in local nonprofits matters people do it and they stop doing it when they think it doesn't matter and then why should they spend their time and so um, in her essay on violence she talks about how um, uh, one of the reasons people have turned to violence in the 60s and 70s and around the world but also in America is because they came to no longer believe that politics mattered and they um, uh, they thought that their general they, they basically felt disempowered by a rising federal bureaucracy and federal government that was so big and so bureaucratic and so impervious to democratic change that it um, that it could no longer uh, that, that 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 simply being part of the civic democratic process the Republican small r Republican process would not lead to uh, change and so the choice was between apathy and violence and, and that's part of how she understands the rise of, of the violent uh, rhetoric and even actions of the 60s but it's also how she understands um, the rise of apathy so is there a connection between um, the loss of authority and the disempowerment of of the people um, the, the 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 connection is that when you lose authority the the government seeks to keep order and obedience through violence and through um, uh, bureaucratic administrative uh, control of the people um, instead of through free uh, acceptance of the laws and once that happens um, the people uh, lose their conviction that they can that they are living a democracy of self-government 
uh, because now they don't, now they're confront not elected representatives or themselves, but bureaucrats who are unelected, appointed often through, you know, uh, patronage or, or through nepotism or through bribes or whatever it is. And when you confront a bureaucracy, which she calls a rule of bureaus or a rule of nobody, you don't feel like you can make a difference. And so it's the, the bureaucracy is in some sense a replacement for authority and authority and thus the loss of authority leads to increasing bureaucracy, increasing administration, a decrease in self-government and a sense of empowerment and thus apathy. Um, that was on, I think that works and uh, happy to hear thoughts on it. I, I'm just thinking that that's probably the most dangerous um, as you know, uh, observation of our society today that it is the apathy. Um, I know that there's demonstrations against certain things that this current president has proposed and um, but yet for the average person, at least the people that I know, it doesn't matter. So they don't get involved and I think that that it, it diminishes the um, the power of the authority because I don't think that authority is necessarily a bad thing either. But it has to be an authority that's flexible, malleable, that meets the needs of the people in that particular time. And I think that's what has not happened in America in the last 10 or 20 years. Yeah, I mean, so here I'll put on my optimist hat for a second, Johanna. And, yeah. uh, you know, some of you have heard me say this, but I think it bears being said. Um, I think you can't understand what's going on now in a five or 10 year frame. Um, I think the apathy and disempowerment and disenfranchisement stretches back at least 50 to 70 years. Um, and, uh, and in that time, there have been moments of renewed activism and engagement. One was the 1960s and the civil rights movement. Um, uh, and there have been others, but the most recent two uh, were the Tea Party on the right and Occupy and now um, Indivisible on the left. And we could even add Black Lives Matter, I think, as well. And, um, and my optimistic take is that there are large numbers of people in this country who are responding to what they see as a betrayal of their idea of the government. Some people in the Tea Party, some people in Indivisible, some people in Black Lives Matter, not by apathy, but by engagement. Um, just to give a small contrast, I just got back from Russia where I was giving some talks and I was shocked at how many people told me that for the first time in their lives, they really have no hope and that they're actually not telling people what they think because they're afraid that the people they're talking to, even their friends might be informants or might be, um, you know, working for the government or turn them in. Um, I, I had never heard this in my, you know, 25 years of going to Russia until two or three different people in two or three different circumstances told me that this trip. And, um, what you start to see is the evacuation of politics and the evacuation of the public sphere. And I fear that is happening there. Um, I don't fear that happening here yet. Now, is it possible it will? Of course. But so far, um, I've been deeply um, emboldened by and, and excited by, first the Tea Party, even though I didn't agree with the Tea Party's politics, I thought the Tea Party was a good sign for America because it showed citizen activism and now by indivisible. Um, and, you know, by the way, at our, I should mention at our conference at the RN Center conference in October coming up, uh, uh, the topic this year is citizenship and civil, civil disobedience. And it's precisely these kind of activities. And um, the opening two hours are going to be a talk by um, Professor Theta Scotchpole of Harvard, who studied both the Tea Party and the indivisible movements. 
and then a conversation with her and members of the Tea Party and members of Indivisible and members of Black Lives Matter as a way of thinking about this moment of citizen activism in our time. And um, I actually am really excited for that uh, event. So I hope a lot of you will be able to come. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, 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 I think apathy is a huge problem. I think it's a big danger. But I actually see right now one of those moments of engagement. Um, and I hope that continues. I mean, certainly as someone who spends his time teaching young people, I can tell you they're engaged. Um, they're really engaged. And so can we I, may be helpless, but they're not. Can I say something? Who's that? Yeah. It's who said Daphne. that? It's Daphna. Hi, go ahead. Um, I think that one of the problems about apathy that I see in the United States, maybe not so much in Europe, is the fact that what we're seeing is a lot of people angry, um, and it, sp it stems to a large extent from the spirit of entitlement that is perhaps best characterized in consumer terms. And they have more than I do, and I'm entitled to my Jaguar or whatever it is I'm entitled to, and my Trump Tower has to be in gold so everybody knows that I have it. And the least discussed issue, which I think is really at the core of this, is the universal growth of inequality, um, which is a return to a previous, maybe more justifiable reason for um, parties coming up and, and demonstrations and all of that, which is spearing the spirit. But the people that voted for Trump were the ones who were probably the most affected by this spirit of entitlement and severe inequality, which very few economists are actually discussing. It's beginning, but it's a taboo subject for, it has been a taboo subject for a lot. I mean, thanks to Piketty, it's becoming more of an issue. Um, and I also think that some of the uh, movements that we're seeing now um, as a response to serious injustices that are being perceived um, may be perhaps a, uh, a revival of, of, of a sense of, of belonging to um, a major democratic force that is, that is being lost. Uh, that's it. Sorry. That, that's it. That's excellent. Um, I, I, there's no doubt that inequality and the extraordinary inequality of the moment um, is, is, is part and parcel of the problem. Um, and I think there's no doubt that it's causing anger. Um, what's interesting is... Um, how, how paralyzed people are about how to address it, um, you know, and, 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 and so all I want to add to what you said, which I, everything you said, Devna, I agree with. The only thing I would add is that I think that there's at least two causes or three causes of the anger. So one is economic inequality. One might we call racial and, and, and religious and gender and other inequalities. Um, and then the third is um, the rise of what's considered by many people to be a non-democratic elite bureaucratic uh, um, elite that runs things, both corporate, governmental, and economic, and cultural. And so the inequality is economic, but it's also cultural. And it's also um, political. And I think uh, these three different inequalities um, anger different people differently and um, all need to be addressed. Um, and I think they're all connected in important ways. Um, but uh, so that's all I would add to what you said, which I, I think is, is deeply important. Um, Raphael writes, would it be fair to say that for our end, the same lack of authority in the modern world that allows the emerging of totalitarian regimes also makes it possible for revolutions to happen? Um, your English is perfect, uh, so 
No apologies necessary, Raphael. Um, I think it makes it possible. Uh, it's worth taking a look uh, at the end of what is authority, right? The I told you this. This is related to that book. Uh, you don't have it in front of you, so I'll have to read it for you. Um, she says that revolutions, um, which we commonly regard as radical breaks with tradition, um, uh, on the other hand, are born out of this tradition. And then she says, authority as we once knew it, which grew out of the Roman experience of foundation and was understood in the light of the Greek political philosophy, has nowhere been reestablished, either through revolutions or through even less promising means of restoration. And least of all, through the conservative moods and trends which occasionally sweep public opinion. So certainly not through the conservative move towards tyranny will authority be reestablished, and not even has it been reestablished through revolutions, although the American Revolution, she will argue in, on revolution written five years later, at least did it for a while. Then she says, for to live in a political realm with neither authority nor the concomitant awareness that the source of authority transcends power and those who are in power, and here's the key part, means to be confronted anew, to be confronted anew, to see, to, to be confronted with, and you have to look at it in its face, the elementary problems of human living together, right? I mean, and this comes back to Bob's question, right? I mean, people say she's into ideal types or she's nostalgic or what, you know, what Arendt is right, really about is about the elementary problems of human living together. How do we live together? And what she says is one way we live together is through violence, tyrants, dictators, and then they keep order. Another is through authority, where we have we accept some authority and it's and we are freely obey it. Another is through totalitarianism, where we extinguish all freedom. These are all ways to live together. But in a world without authority, where we don't want tyranny or totalitarianism, we are confronted anew with this elementary problem of human living together. And um, and so, uh, Raphael, uh, how do we address that? Well, she thinks we need we need in some way a new foundation, but um, there's no claim on her part that she knows what that is. She's not a prophet. She's not telling you what to do. She always says that she's not someone who does that. What she does is help us think through the problems and get clarity onto what the problems are. And, and if you can see that as the problem, I think you can see what our task is, which is to think how are we going to live together and figure out how to um, uh, <laughs> how to um, create institutions that have authority or freedom that allow us to live together in ways that are um, human and free. Um, I don't think there's one answer to it, but I think we have to constantly try new ideas. And, and revolutions, insofar as revolutions tear down what is, offer a moment for new foundations. That's, un, that's undeniable. And so, yes, I think she is one of the reasons she's a thinker of revolutions, and she writes a book on revolution right after writing these essays on authority and freedom, is that she's interested in the question of, can we, through a revolution, found authority and found freedom? And again, five years after this, she writes a book and says, yeah, in America they did. It didn't last, but it did. And she thinks that if you follow that example, and yet also change it for your situations, there's always possibilities that you might create a miracle again. Um, but I think the other part of it is, and this is, you know, this is the, I guess, the more depressing part, most people live without freedom. 
I mean, most of history is left without freedom or without a lot of it. And we have to then understand that we can't always have pure authority and pure freedom. Sometimes we're going to have to settle for less. And then our job is to make sure it doesn't become totalitarian, which is the worst. How to distinguish fascism from tyranny, Ron asks, and totalitarianism and authoritarianism. Albright has just finished fascism, a warning. Um, so this is her way of characterizing our greatest threat with weakness of democracy. Okay, I mean, these are, uh, I mean, this is what uh, a number of pages in this book are about, is what the difference is between fascism, tyranny, uh, authority. But I mean, it's a much, it's done in a much longer way in, in, in what is authority, and it's done even more in depth in Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, in brief, uh, for her, authoritarianism is obedience mixed with freedom. Uh, tyranny uh, is um, uh, a violent bureaucratic rule uh, of one over everyone else or a small group over everyone else, but that still leaves room for freedom in non-political spaces. Um, and then there's fascism and totalitarianism. And um, the big markers of fascism and totalitarianism that separate them from tyranny are the emergence of movements and the use of terror. Um, this goes back to the origins of totalitarianism. They replace political parties with movements. And um, this is what she describes in your text on, on pages uh, 72 through 77. Um, and um, the, a movement is, 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 is a movement doesn't seek political goals because once they achieve those goals, a party achieves goals, it stops and it lets people be. A movement needs to constantly uh, set new goals and, uh, and set even impossible goals because what it seeks is not policies or some end. It seeks constant control and power and it needs to constantly feed this movement. Um, and so um, in fascism at the beginning and totalitarianism, movements replace parties. The difference between fascism and totalitarianism, which is a little more complicated for her, is that um, the movements, once they take power, turn into more political parties and stop being a movement and stop seeking world, to, world uh, total governance and total domination. Um, and become more of a traditional political party. Um, so I haven't read uh, uh, Albright's book yet, although I, I plan to. I'm reading right now a big book on fascism um, by Payne, P-A-Y-N-E, which is interesting. Um, I, think, I think fascism is a problem today, um, insofar as I think a lot of these uh, um, uh, people that I've talked about, Orban and Hungary and Erdogan and, and even Trump, and this is the argument I made in the long essay I wrote in the Los Angeles Review of Books, um, are actually movement politicians. And they are mobilizing movements. And, you know, I think it's completely wrong to think of Trump as a Republican. Um, he's, a, he's a Trumpian. He's a, he's a movement. He's creating a movement. And and he, and that's why he has constant rallies. He's not a traditional politician, and he's he needs to constantly mobilize his base. Um, and so, and yet, he's not a totalitarian movement politician because once he attains power, he's trying to govern through party structures and not trying to destroy them. And and that's that's a big difference. So I actually think fascism is a real worry today. Um, and, uh, and I think that you can now probably legitimately call Viktor Orban a fascist um, and maybe Putin and others, I'm not sure. Um, 
uh, but I don't think they're totalitarian. And, uh, and so I think that's why, again, you know, they're still bad. Um, but uh, these are distinctions that I think it's worth making in order for us to, to understand what we're talking about. Very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Suzanne writes, um, were there conversations, debates between Arendt and the authors of the big important text, The Authoritarian Personality? Um, I would think she would have at least criticized their use of the word authoritarian. Um, Sam, do you want to say anything about, because I know Sam recently taught that text in her work, Samantha, are you here? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah, I wrote a comment back briefly. Not that I aren't doesn't directly comment on um, the work that Adorno, Adorno co-published out of UC Berkeley in the 50s. Um, they had a famously antagonistic relationship. Um, she hated him. Uh, and I, it's not clear to me that she actually read um, a lot of his work. She wrote to Jaspers that he was the most disgusting man she had ever met. And remarked there there come nix uns in house or something you know that one will never step foot in our house um so i think that the antagonism got in the way of a intellectual engagement um they are both thinking about the same questions though and how to provide an account of the emergence of totalitarianism in the middle of the 20th century um and the nature of anti-semitism and authoritarianism and fascist governments um adorno is coming at it from a kind of marxist freudo marxist framework um out of the so-called frankfurt school tradition of critical theory and arendt is coming at it more with a kind of benjaminian approach thinking about history and the different elements that um forged together in terms of economy and racism over time <laughs> i think there are a lot of differences to be drawn out in the way that they approach the question. There's a vol I'll just add, there's a volume on Arendt and Adorno that was published, I think probably five or six years ago now. I don't I'm not remember exactly, but um, there are some essays in there on authoritarianism and overlaps in their work, if anyone's interested in that question specifically. It's called Arendt and Adorno. An original title. Um... Yeah, so thank you, Sam, and uh, I hope that helps Suzanne. Um, I know Sam's been working on that text, so I thought she could say more than I could. Um, Jennifer uh, writes, when worshiping the Constitution was being discussed, I couldn't help but think about the conservative goal to gather two-thirds of legislatures and invoke Article 5 of the Constitution in order to change the Constitution. A convention would be called. I'm not sure what they would want to change, but I'm sure it will not be good. My question is this, have these people stopped respecting the Constitution? Um, that's a good question. And I mean, I actually, I, 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 you know, it's the first I've heard of that movement. Um, I'm sure some of you know that, um, I think Larry Lessig and a couple of others, there's, a, there's Stanford Levinson and others have been arguing on the left for a constitutional convention. Um, so uh, I think what we can say is, that there's uh, a sense on both the left and the right that um, there's a desirability for a constitutional convention. Um, why? Uh, I, I don't think it's a lack of respect. I think it's a sense that um, the, the Constitution has uh, well, I think it comes for different reasons for different people, but some think it's out of date, right? Um, some think it's lost its power or its authority. I guess the authority would be the right word in the Arendtian sense. Um, and, 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 and then I think some people simply think, you know, if it's going to be something that we love and we respect and we have authority for, we have to, it has to live for us and, and maybe it's just too old. Um, and so I think there are a lot of people and I, I, will, I will say that there have been moments when I've been, I've been asked and tempted to join this movement to call for a convention. And I find it a very alluring idea, but also a terrifying one because as weakened as the constitution has been, it's still there and there are still people who respect it. 
And uh, I fear that if we call the Constitutional Convention today, we would never get anywhere. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things that we have to remember is that the Constitutional Convention that led to the 1789 Convention was a bunch of large, was white men uh, who, you know, were from the South and the North and disagreed about certain things, but generally, uh, generally agreed about quite a lot. Um, who, how would we pick who would go to the Constitutional Convention today in our era of diversity and identity politics and income inequality? And I mean, who would go? And how many thousands would have to go in order for people to feel represented? And how could you have a constitution that could be agreed upon by thousands and thousands of people? I, I just, I can't imagine something. Uh, I mean, part of the problem is that in 1789, you had a bunch of people who were considered to be the elites, who people trusted. Maybe they didn't have a choice, but they did. Um, I don't even know who the elites would be today. I don't know who would go to a constitutional convention. So I, I find it to be a, a truly terrifying idea um, in the end. But I think the the desire for one is one I understand. I think people want to reinvigorate <coughs> um, our political system and the authority uh, underlying it. So um, I wouldn't politicize it conservative and liberal. I mean, I think there's, I've heard more about the liberal movements for liberal, liberal calls for it. I mean, I think there's a general sense that the constitution is uh, weak and weakened in its authority and people want to, a lot of people and for good reasons want to uh, strengthen it. But I, I fear that, I fear that in trying to strengthen it, we'd weaken it. Um, I don't know. That's just, look, that's not, it's not our end. I have no, special whatever that's just my political opinion um harold writes few and unimportant would be few and unimportant would the errors of men be i love that oh this is coleridge no wonder um if they did but know first what they themselves mean and secondly what the words mean by which they attempt to convey their meaning thank you harold um i'll take that to be an endorsement of rn's view that we should make distinctions and speak carefully. Absolutely, and I think that uh, that's what popped up when I began to, to read this, because I know that there was going to be difficulty in understanding the way that she was using words. And I, I felt it was a really great exercise to be able to get beyond my uh, commonest knowledge of the word authority and look at it in the way that she was. So have we have we got beyond it yet, Harold? I don't know. <laughs> All right, we'll try more. Um, could authoritarianism be distinguished from totalitarian regimes because of the social contract? Uh, Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, you know, the social contract, uh, I mean, there's different social contracts, but I don't think uh, Arendt sees um, the social contract, at least in the normal way it's understood, or the, the common way of Hobbes to be one of authoritarianism. Um, I mean, violence, yes, uh, but not authoritarianism. So, I'm not sure how that would fit. If you want to add to it, Daphne, um, you can. I just thought it sort of reflected on the fact that people agreed with the authority and therefore oh, I accepted it. And in that respect, it was very different from totalitarian regimes. But I don't know if that's useful. Right. Yeah. I'm, yeah, again, like there's different views of the social contract. Uh, the Habesian view is not that we agree with the authority, we simply accept it because it will keep peace, um, which is very different from agreeing with it um, or, or finding it freeing. Um, what, what Arendt calls mutual compact uh, as a different form of contract where everyone gets together and 
mutually agrees to live together according to um, self-government um, would be closer to uh, a kind of purely democratic authority. Um, but, uh, but I don't think she usually sees the social contract as, as not authoritarian, but as more, um, more tyrannical or uh, bureaucratic. Kevin writes, I wonder, Roger, if you or others on the call have been following Andrew Sullivan's writing on Trump in New York Magazine. He also interestingly has a recent piece on events in Hungary. But in a recent piece on Trump, he uses Plato's discussion of the rise of the tyrant in late stage democracy as a filter for understanding Trump. Sullivan is a conservative, but it just seems like it might be interesting to compare and contrast Aaron's discussion in this piece with Plato's and Sullivan's approach. Yeah, I mean, I've. I've linked to and written about um, Andrew's use of the, the platonic analogy in Amor Mundi, you know, the, uh, the weekly newsletter we send out, um, but it's been a while. He's been doing it for a while. And, 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 and so um, I don't remember precisely everything he says or what I've said about it, but I, I will say that um, in general, uh, it's, it's, it's an important insight. Um, democracy, Plato says, uh, is a, a kind of, um, emerges out of a, a sense of um, unfettered freedom and thus a rejection, uh, unfettered equality, and thus a rejection of, of all uh, distinctions. And in such a rejection of distinctions, um, a, 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 a refusal of judgment, a refusal of, 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 of the good and the bad. And, and this um, will lead to um, all sorts of resentments um, and, uh, and disorder and a sense of freedom run amok. And it's all too likely that some one of these Democrats uh, will um, emerge who can rouse the people as a demagogue and um, unite them back under a kind of um, demagogic, uh, tyrannical leadership. And so Plato sees democracy as the breeding ground for tyrants. Um, I, I think that's a generally accurate uh, description. Um, the Arendtian caveat to that uh, is that she doesn't think that the United States was a democracy. Uh, it was supposed to be, and what, what a constitutional Republican government with democratic elements. And so the whole premise of the United States was that it was not supposed to um, lead to that kind of um, unfettered equality uh, and lack of distinction. It was supposed to be governed by an elite, the aristocrats who were be elected. Um, and, uh, and, and the, uh, obviously that has changed. I mean, Andrew Jackson was the first democratic president in the United States. It's not an accident that Donald Trump sees Andrew Jackson as his, um, pre as his model. Uh, Trump is, I think, as Sullivan rightly says, a demagogic figure. Um, and uh, it's um, made possible by the increasingly um, uh, um, uh, uh, increasingly um, democratic nature of the country in the sense that we are unwilling increasingly to make value judgments and judgments of good and bad, judgments of right and wrong, um, which uh, leads to a kind of sense of, for many people, moral anarchy or, or freedom that um, leads people to want someone to come and reestablish order. Um, that was Plato's insight. Uh, and I don't think it's been proven wrong. <laughs>
Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Kevin. What about the fracturing of the family today and how this is even greater than it was in the 60s? This seems to be a prominent factor affecting the cause of apathy and violence. Yeah, I mean, it's not an accident that Arendt on the very first page of this essay um, talks about the most extreme manifestation of this climate. Uh, and by the way, this is sort of what I mean by democracy run amok, equality run amok in her mind. Um, uh, that the most extreme manifestation of this is the breakdown um, of the authority of parents over children, teachers over pupils, and generally of the elder over the younger. Um, she sees this uh, loss of authority as, I mean, she says, even in the most, even in tyrannical regimes, even in totalitarian regimes, authority generally in school and in families is is still accepted it's the most basic form of authority and the idea that you know we talk about children's rights and the century of the child um is for her uh, a sign of the of the just the extent of the loss of authority in our time it's not just political authority it's all authority and that for her is very dangerous um so another essay that she writes in Beyond, I mean, in Between Past and Future is the essay Crisis in Education, uh, which again, we've talked about and, and you can watch the video, uh, both the introductory video and the discussion of it on our website, if you'd like. Um, and in that essay, um, she talks about the consequences of the loss of authority in education and how dangerous she thinks it is. And, um, she suggests that even though authority is lost and can't be restored in politics, we have to, we have to, she says, um, even if it means uh, lying to ourselves and our children, uh, we have to maintain authority in education because there's no way you can teach people uh, without authority. And so um, uh, the, 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 the connection to the family is, is very important in, in, her, in her understanding of the loss of authority. Um, Suzanne writes, I think we understand Arendt's use of the term authoritarianism and how it is different from other terms. Harold, you may be the only one, I guess. No, I think we probably all are trying to. But maybe we need to better understand why her use hasn't been more widely adopted. Uh, I think both in academic and popular circles, the youth of authoritarianism is bad, is the view that dominates. Why are we so resistant to her clarity? Well, um, that's a, I mean, I, okay, let's take that question with utter seriousness. Um, because, as she says, liberals see authority as the opposite of freedom. And conservatives see freedom as the opposite of authority. And as long as we see it that way, um, we will never be able to understand authoritarian as she understands it. Um, and she thinks that both liberalism and conservatism are two sides of the same coin uh, that emerge from um, a philosophy of history, which sees the world as progressing along a, a certain um, a certain path. And um, uh, if you're a liberal, you think that path is increasing freedom. And if you're a conservative, you think that path is increasing um, uh, um, loss of authority. And both paths lead to uh, totalitarianism or the loss of freedom. That's one. Or two, if you're a social scientist, which many of people in academia are, uh, you see, uh, you look at this functionally and you say, well, tyranny is about obedience and authoritarianism is about obedience. So they both seek obedience. They have the same function. Therefore, they're the same. Or violence is the same as, 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 as authority because they both seek obedience. Um, so she gives you her reasons why she thinks people don't see this. Um, 
Uh, and I think she's right. I mean, maybe that's too simplistic. I mean, a lot of it's also just popular. I mean, we've popularized, I mean, most people don't think about it. We've popularized the idea of authoritarian as bad and, 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 and go back to children and families, right? You know, my kids call me authoritarian all the time. Um, and they don't mean something nice by it. Um, you know, and when I try and tell them that they need authority because that's how they, you know, will learn what's right. They don't like that, but it's true. And, and yet in our parenting books, you know, okay, some say that I think, but there's a real fear of, a, I think most parents are afraid of being authoritarian today. It's just got a, it has a bad sense because we don't trust authority. Um, and yet I think Arendt is talking to us about how dangerous it is to live in a world in which we don't trust authority. Now, that doesn't mean we should trust tyrants or bad parents, right? And that's part of the problem is we have lost a common sense of, of what a good parent would do. All right, we are over time and I'm going to have to run. Um, uh, thank you guys all. Uh, I hope you're really enjoying these new essays in this book. Uh, I am. It's a treat for me to have, be able to read these all for the first time with you. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in, in two weeks. I hope you're enjoying the beginning of spring and baseball season. Right, Harold? I'm going to the game tonight. Wow. Very excited. Very good. Very good. Excellent. See you guys all in two weeks. Enjoy. Bye-bye.